Thank you, Mayor and fellow chairs. I want to introduce uh, Gennady Bagdasarian. Uh, he's been introduced before. He's been introduced as a special guest. But I want to point out that last night he had really won with Tom Mitchell. And if, I'll just recommend, if you ever had a chance just to sit in as a, as a backseater at one of Tom Mitchell's early runs, I'd say take take the opportunity. It was really inspiring. I, I was glad I went. But anyway, welcome, Gennady. Uh, I'd like to introduce um, my guest. Uh, what's your name again? <laughs> uh, Bob Barbara Barbara Lowline. Oh, thank you. I'd like to introduce Mrs. Spitzer, kind Spitzer, my wife. Honey, thank you. Right in the far reaches of the room. I can't. I can't even see who it is. Okay. Uh, Hi, Patty. Hi, uh, President Luann and uh, Rotarians. I'd like to introduce my guests, Rick Shaughnessy and Regina New, both instrumental in the success of the Schools Foundation when I was there for 15 years. All right. All right. Okay, thank you to everyone, to all our guests for coming. Um, as we always do, we have the Red Badgers stand up that are with us today. So if you don't know them, at least introduce yourself after the meeting. So is Ronnie Hausler here today? Ronnie, you here? Okay, I don't see her. I don't know if Tim Quast was, okay, there's Tim back there. Um, there's Tim. Uh, Joe Malo, Malloy, I should say that. There he is right there. And then Georgia Farrell, he was here and Georgia's back there. Okay, Keith Manning is right here and Sarah Sheverton is right there. And I think that's everybody. All right. We've got Eric and Jacqueline here on, um, so I'm just going to go over some quick announcements before we start the program. Um, usually we have for the last year, the city sponsors a Halloween happening at Spreckles Park. That's going to be on September, on Friday, September 28th from 3.30 to 5.30. So if you want to join in, they have the children, we have little games and give them treats and that type of thing. What? What did I say September? I'm sorry. I get it. So it's October 28th. Um, it's either Brittany Teeter or Natalie Bailey. Then if you're interested in co-sponsoring the Christmas party, I'll uh, also see Natalie Bailey. So last Friday, we had an amazing event, the wine tasting uh, fundraiser, which was so successful. And since we're kind of low on time today, what we're going to do is next week which we're at the dell and then the next week so the next two weeks we're going to show a lot of the photos and talk about that event so didn't want anybody to think that we're avoiding that at all so on october 8th on saturday is beach cleanup and then the social is on october 13th on thursday and it's going to be at helen uh, Kupka's house so um, that's in the case so we'll be announcing more on that and then for next week's meeting it will be at the Dell it will be live no zoom and that will be our city candidate forum so let's get started and I want to introduce past president Scott Mesker who will start our forum Yeah. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm pleased to see we have a large turnout uh, live in the room, and I'm sure via Zoom for our school district board of trustees forum today. Thank you all very much for being here. As you probably know, there are four board of trustees seats up for election this year. Three of those seats are for a four-year term and one of those seats is for a two-year term. We're fortunate to have nine of the 11 announced candidates who are running here with us today, 
And I personally like to thank each one of them for joining us uh, for this forum. And I think you all should just come on up right now and sit where your uh, name tags are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oops. The sacred bell. The sacred flag. It's fine. Can you guys get in here? I'm sorry. From my left to right. Okay, there it is, Michael Iris. Okay, we got it right. Okay. I'll get out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, we all have, uh, everybody has a name tag in front of them, but I'm going to introduce everybody. Seated from my left to my right, we have Michael Iverson, Stephanie Anderson, uh, Malasi Sandy. Did I butcher your name? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Jerry Mason, uh, Helen Anderson Cruz, Renee Cavanaugh, Alexio Palacios Peters, Scott Youngblood, and Lisa Valladol Valladolid Miglioli. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, to be clear, uh, Nicole candidates Nicole Boucher, Renee Cavanaugh, and Jerry Mansion are running for uh, Jerry Mason are running for the two-year term. All the other candidates are running for the four-year term. Uh, the it's Nicole Boucher, Renee Cavanaugh, and Jerry Mason are running for the two-year term. No, we're not going to do that anymore. Okay. All the remaining candidates are running for the four-year term. We have two candidates uh, that are not with us today, Mark Schur and Nicole Boucher. Uh, I'd like very briefly to go over the rules of engagement for today. This information was provided to each of the candidates ahead of time, but I want everybody to know uh, how we're going to proceed today. Uh, to be fair to the candidates in answering questions, their names were drawn randomly to determine the seating chart for the head table. Each candidate will be asked to stand with the microphone when answering their question. Three identical questions will be asked of each candidate. We have a fourth question if we have time, uh, with each one receiving the same amount of time to answer the question. The first question was shared with each of our candidates in advance, but the remaining two questions will be new to the panel. Uh, the candidates will have 90 seconds to answer the first question and one minute each for the second and third question and maybe fourth. The first question will be asked alphabetically by last name. Then I will ask to proceed from my left to right for the second question and right to left for the third question. We look forward to civility and decorum throughout the forum. And we ask the candidates to stay on topic when answering each question. There are timekeepers seated in the front of the room. Uh, they will signal uh, 20 seconds prior to the end of the time period and then 10 seconds prior to the end of the time period. And when the time is up, I will cut the candidates off if they have not finished. So without further ado, we can proceed with the first question. <clears throat> and that is going to be, um, please introduce yourself and describe the background, education, experience, service, or skills that you have that make you uniquely qualified to serve on the Coronado Unified School District School Board and if you are an incumbent, please identify yourself as such. We're going to start on this one with uh, Stephanie Anderson. There we go. And you'd like us to stand? Please, yeah. All right. All right. Well, hello, Rotary. A lot of you already know me. My name is Stephanie Anderson, and I have a long history in Coronado. My grandparents came down to Coronado during the Depression. My mother and aunt grew up here. They went to Sacred Heart, then Our Lady of Peace. I was born in Coronado, went to Coronado Middle School, or elementary school, middle school, high school, graduated from CHS, and then went to San Diego State University. My uh, children went to the Coronado schools, and my youngest just graduated in 2021, Clark Anderson. I am a homeowner in the village, 
and I own a small business, Island Yoga Coronado in Coronado. Um, even before I joined Coronado Rotary, I lived the motto, service above self. I have volunteer taught um, before COVID stopped. I volunteer taught uh, yoga at the juvenile hall in Kearney Mesa and at the Barrio Logan Court School, which is where kids coming out of juvenile hall go to high school if they can't return to their home schools. I have been gardening parent in the elementary school. I have been room parent too many times to count. I have been on the PTO and on the Islander Sports Foundation board. I, my favorite volunteer position was with the Coronado football uh, program and I was booster president for four years. Um, and we, during that time we were dealing with COVID, oh my goodness, and uh, we won the district championship. Um, I'm a proud member of Rotary, of Chamber of Commerce, and most importantly, I think I have the enthusiasm, the energy, and the um, courage to take on this job. Our next candidate will be Helen Anderson Cruz. Hi, I am the incumbent. I've uh, been on the school board for four years. I'm running as a true nonpartisan candidate, unaffiliated with any political party, and I've accepted no donations. My campaign is self-funded. I have um, invested, I am invested in continuing the academic excellence of, of Coronado School District. We have wonderful teachers. We have excellent um, academic programs for our students, and we are interested in preparing all of our students to ensure that they are, they are able to exercise their full potential. My professional credentials include a doctorate in education from the University of Southern California, Dan Orr. Um, I have a master's in governance, a master's of arts in education, a bachelor of arts in English literature and French. I've taught at USC in the Graduate School of Education at San Diego State and the College of Business and in Arts and Sciences, and in a teacher credentialing program at National University. I've served on two blue ribbon panels for the Department of Education in Sacramento, one was um, the Language Arts Advisory Panel, where we reviewed um, language arts standards and aligned them with content area standards. I've had 30 years of service with uh, Coronado District, too many committees to mention, and too many homecoming floats. I'm the proud mother of a graduate of Coronado Elementary, Middle School, and High School, who is now a first grade teacher. Thank you. Our next candidate will be Renee Cavanaugh. Good afternoon. My name is Renee Cavanaugh, and I'm running for the two-year position on the um, school board. When my husband and I moved here over 20 years ago, I decided to change careers midstream. I went to San Diego State University, got my multiple subject teaching credential, and spent my entire 15-year teaching career here in Coronado Schools at Village Elementary, and at Silver Strand Elementary. As a teacher leader, I was interested in how our district was operating and how it managed. And so I started attending school board meetings about five years ago and have attended those fairly regularly. I have three grandchildren that go to school in the district and I have volunteered for almost every organization, I think in town from the uh, concerts in the park on Sunday night to Coronado Junior Women's Club to um, the Coronado Schools Foundation. I sat on the board as the executive um, board for CSF for many years and was chairman of the board for two plus years um, at that. Um, as a small business owner, my husband and I have hired CHS students. We've hired Coronado alumni. I think the breadth and depth of my experience that I've had in, here in the community and in our schools can't be matched by my other two candidates. I'm a passionate advocate for students and I'd appreciate your support and your vote. Thank you. Our next candidate will be Michael Iverson. Hi, I'm Michael Iverson. And thank you for having us uh, all today and appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody here uh, this afternoon. So I uh, moved to Coronado about five and a half years ago. Um, I'm originally from Denmark. 
Um, so for me, I've, I've had the opportunity to live all over the world. My, my dad served as a foreign service officer in the Danish Foreign Service. So I attended school uh, on three different continents uh, at six different types of schools in my life. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, depending on who you ask of my kids, we subjected them to the same type of thing. So we moved all over with them and they have uh, gone through all kinds of different schools in many states around the country. And so I've had the opportunity to see kind of every aspect of different school systems that you can imagine from private to public to charter. And I'm really running uh, primarily to introduce uh, parent oversight uh, in the district. I think that's something that's been lacking. Ultimately, our kids and our educators are our customers. Um, and if anything, uh, my 25 year career in sales leadership in the medical world has taught me it's that you gotta be close to the customer to understand what they need. Uh, and so as a parent, I think um, we're uniquely positioned to understand what the customer needs. Uh, and my intent here is to be here for the four years that my current freshman son has left in the high school when my daughter is a senior. Uh, and once they leave, I will be leaving as well. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, and I hope you can enjoy your Christmas today. All right, thank you. Uh, our next candidate is Jerry Mason. Hello, Jerry Machen. I'm running for the two-year seat. There's three names on the ballot, and you can only choose one. Um, I'm a retired teacher and uh, a small business owner in the past, many years ago, many chapters ago at this age. Um, I'm running because I've been going to uh, the school board meetings for about the last year and a half. I became concerned when both of my children at the time, um, a ninth grader and a sixth grader at the time, um, had a lesson. I was not notified. My husband wasn't um, about this lesson on gender preference and um, what is your, a survey, basically a question, what is your preferred pronoun? I started to get worried, talked to the teacher, then the principals, and then went to the school board. I've been going ever since and I've noticed a lot of things going on that I think um, parents do need to be involved. So I do appreciate another parent saying that. Um, I do think that uh, some of the other issues that came up that were troublesome uh, was the four by four implementation when 95% of the teachers at the high school were opposed to it. Uh, they did come to the school board and voice that, but it was pushed through anyway. Um, other issues were, uh, let's see, Gosh, um, well, tortilla gate, which is the number one thing people talk to me about when I go door to door. To door. So anyway, I'm done. All right, thank you. Our next candidate is Alexia Palacios-Peters. No, you're next. Hello, everyone. Thank you for allowing us to be here today. My name is Alexia Palacios Peters. And as a candidate, I bring a diverse viewpoints and qualifications to the school board race. First, I'm a parent of three students here in Coronado Unified School District. I have a sophomore at the high school. I have a seventh grader at the middle school and I have a fourth grader at Village Elementary. And so I bring that viewpoint to the school board as a parent. My second qualification is I'm a military spouse. My husband and I have spent 20 years uh, uh, living the Navy life and our school district right now is 41% military. So that is a significant population here in our school district. And I believe that that voice should be represented on the school board. Currently our district receives over $6 million in Department of Defense Education Agency grant money. And we just received another $1.5 million of grant fund funds from DODIA specifically for math and STEM programs. I'm also a former teacher. I received my undergraduate degree in elementary education with a specialization in early childhood development. And I taught in Austin, Texas. And I also taught here in San Diego and National School District. And so I bring that viewpoint of a teacher to my candidacy as a school board candidate. Lastly, I'm an attorney. I'm barred in California. Texas. I was formerly barred in Virginia, and I'm also barred in the Supreme Court of the United States. And so I bring my background as an attorney to the school board, which spends most of its time looking at laws, policies, and making sure that we are doing what we can to continue receiving the funds that we do. 
Thank you. All right, our next candidate is Malasi Sandy. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I go by Mal, it's Maliki. Uh, Maliki, sorry. Maliki, so St. Maliki founded Dublin, Ireland in uh, 988 AD. So that's the history lesson. And uh, so my mom's from Ireland, so I get stuck with that name. Um, originally from those, actually, I feel like I'm very uh, friendly confines here because I did my whole, most of my adult life, most of my life actually in the Navy. So this nautical place is really nice. It's nice to be near the water here. Uh, I'm originally from Los Altos, California, which is up near Palo Alto, if anybody knows the Bay Area. Um, joined the, went to Naval Academy, graduated in 90, came here in 92 as a helicopter pilot. And uh, fortunate enough, my wife and I bought a house way back then when prices were down and people weren't buying. So that was a great time to be here. Uh, we moved uh, all over the country in, the, in my 30 year career, uh, Japan, Rhode Island, Virginia, Florida, Tennessee. So uh, with our four sons, we got to experience all the different school districts and what they had to offer. And we can compare and contrast that to Coronado. Um, I've had experience leading organizations. Uh, my most enjoyable tour was uh, commanding officer of a helicopter squadron on board the USS Enterprise. Um, and then I've managed programs at, at Sp it was called Spay War, now Naval in Information Warfare Center across the Bay. I was what was called a detailer. I think I see Admiral Bennett back there. I see a lot of familiar Navy faces. But uh, so I did assignments for, for personnel. A lot of uh, uh, experience with budgets, personnel, and uh, very lots of community involvement with coaching teams, and I'm self-funded. I'm taking no donations, um, so I'm only beholden to to the people of the community. Thanks. Our next candidate is Lisa Meglioli. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting us for this organizing this forum for us candidates. My name is Lisa Meglioli. I'm a Parent, I have no political interest or agenda, simply a concerned mom for the well-being of our children. I have five children, my youngest being 11, my oldest 21. I have a personal interest in the academic education of our schools in our community. Being so family-oriented, I have always placed a high priority on education and believe its utmost importance for our children as their future leaders. During this past few challenging years, I became more aware and informed of everything that was happening in our educational system, and it, it really struck a chord with me, so I decided to run for Coronado Unified School Board. I have come to understand that today is critical for us parents and grandparents to get involved more than ever in their education, personal formation, and look after their overall well-being. Since a young age, I've also been involved in our family-owned business, which we still have. And I also had the opportunity to run a small business in Little Italy, giving me the foundation to understand the ins and outs of operating a business from, from the administrative aspect to managing a budget skills, which are applicable for the school board. I believe students are better served when parents and families are able to play a part in the education of their children, which is why I decided and get involved. It would be an honor and privilege to be able to serve the students and families of Coronado in helping improve our local education. All right, system. thank you. And the last candidate has a first name I can pronounce. It's Scott Youngblood. Hi, Scott Youngblood. Um, so I'm a physician and orthopedic surgeon. I grew up in North Carolina and uh, went to K through 12 public schools. Then I went to Duke undergrad and med school. Uh, so uh, those are really expensive. So I ended up taking Navy scholarship that brought me out to San Diego a long time ago. And I've been in the Navy until last year when I retired after 25 years of active duty service. So during that time, I was uh, for the last seven years, I was the chairman of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery up at Balboa. So I had the pleasure of leading that organization with about 120 employees and 20 orthopedic surgeons who all have very strong opinions and think highly of themselves. So I was able to uh, try to keep that uh, group uh, pulling in the, in the same direction. And uh, for better or worse, I have experience dealing with a bureaucracy. Um, I, and uh, it also has a residency. So with 25 orthopedic, sur uh, orthopedic residents. So uh, there's, a, there's a strong didactic program in that. And I was honored to receive the teaching award as selected by the residents in 2018 as the best faculty. So that's, uh, that's definitely one that I treasure. Um, and then uh, other accomplishment or uh, service would be 
Uh, I'm an assistant scoutmaster of Troop Beta 1, and most importantly, I have three uh, uh, kids here who have been in CVSD for the last uh, 11 years. And then um, uh, finally, I'm running for uh, to restore an academic focus, keep politics out of school as much as possible, and to restore uh, parents as the number one stakeholder in their uh, children's education. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, for a second question, I'm going to call on the candidates from my left to right. We're just going to move down the line, and you have one minute to answer this one. And here's the question. In your estimation, what are the top three challenges facing Coronado Unified School District today? First, identify the top three challenges, then explain which one of these is the top priority for you and how you would go about addressing that particular challenge. So we're gonna start with Mr. Iverson. Uh, thank you. So uh, for me, the, the top three challenges are um, oversight, uh, transparency, uh, and um, academic excellence. So um, I guess I'll, I'll look at academic excellence since I have 60 seconds. Um, I find the, the implementation of the four by four program that we started last year that have been uh, really tremendously flawed. Um, all of the things that were promised as part of the four by four program are not coming to fruition. Um, and we're not supporting our learners. And the, the way that they're selling the program to our kids or to parents is, well, it's a great way to remediate grades. In other words, if your kid fails the first semester, then they can retake that same class the second semester. To me, that seems like a crazy uh, way to, to set up program that's not really about academic excellence. We've got to support our learners to do that. So one of the things that was promised as part of the further four is that we would offer additional classes uh, and the choices for our students, but the reality is we don't have the facilities and the classrooms to actually pose those classes and we don't have the teachers to teach them. I'm sorry, we have to cut you off and move to Ms. Anderson. So I think the three things that I'm the most concerned about is the trust of the community. I think that has been eroded away and I think there needs to be steps to remind the community of all the great things that the school board and the schools have done, and also to improve on those things. My second item is really near and dear to my heart, and I'm sure all of yours is after Evaldi and after Sandy Hook, we have got to reevaluate the, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the safety of our schools. As much as it breaks my heart, we can't have doors and windows open during the school day. And part of that means air conditioning because our teachers and our students shouldn't have to decide between sweating to death or missing class. We've got too many heat days and that has to stop. And of course the academic excellence that Coronado schools are known for is paramount and it must always be improved and worked on. Thank you. All right, Mr. Tandy. Um, I would like to see that we keep incrementally improving our schools. I like the four by four schedule. It is hard in an organization to implement change like that. And I think it was successfully done. It's, it was COVID, it was tough, but it was done successfully. Um, in politics, I think will ruin our school board. It, it, they'll create dysfunction. They'll turn into a three ring circus. We've seen that before. And uh, my last thing is the facilities. In order for teachers and students to learn, they can't be in a, in, sitting in a sweat box. Uh, we need air conditioning, mini splits, solar panels. It's hard. It's it's hard now, easy later, right? It's I know that it's it. So I think we should get it done sooner. Sooner the better. All right, Ms. Mason. Okay, my top three are academic excellence, uh, local control, and accountability. I do think we need to restore trust. Um, I'm not sure that most people are aware of our latest um, CASP test scores from the California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress. Um, California performs this test every year. Um, they have the school districts do that. And um, these test scores that I'm gonna give you are similar pre-pandemic as well. Um, in science, only 54% of the students met or exceeded grade level standards. That was science, 54%. English, only 77%. Math, only 62% were at grade, grade level. So this is a challenge. We have to dramatically change that. We can't do this slow incremental thing. And then um, local control is important because uh, top down, 
uh, doesn't work very well locally. We know our needs and then accountability is super important. Thanks. Next up is Ms. Anderson Cruz. Three priorities that I have as school board member are academics, uh, safety, which includes um, facilities upgraded so that our teachers have air conditioning and the children can learn. It's difficult to teach or learn in oppressive heat. And then the third one is teacher morale. It's the thing we don't talk about much, but the teachers have shown up every day in spite of the difficult circumstances and they appreciate the respect and the support that they get from constituents. You know, it's been a tough time for everyone and some of us have gotten a little cranky. Uh, but I firmly believe in my heart that Coronado is filled with good and decent people who want what's best for kids and that's what I want too. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kavanaugh. Thank you. I think it's really important to use data whenever you start talking about priorities and not just what you feel like needs to happen out there. Um, my top three challenges would be to address the physical needs of students, academic needs of students, and then the financial needs of the district. Um, of course, academic support is really important. Um, also, academic acceleration for those students that need it is important as well. Um, secondly, how are we going to work on our budget transitioning from locally controlled funding formula to basic aid? What is that going to look like? What are we going to be able to do in our district because of that? Um, and then the last one is to encourage meaningful dialogue uh, between community members and, um, and the board. I want to emphasize that um, Cornell High School is ranked number 15 out of 195 high schools in the county, top 10%. Our school district is top 10%. We have a uh, history of academic excellence. Doesn't mean that we can't improve on it, but the sky is not yeah, falling. Uh, we're gonna move on to Ms. Palacio Stevens. I believe the top three challenges of our district are mental health for both our students and our teachers and staff, our budget and trust and transparency with the community. And the top one for me is the mental health of our students and our teachers. All three of these priorities trickle down to affect everything else. You can't get to academic excellence if the mind space of our students and our teachers are not in the right area. And so the way to address this is to ensure we provide programs and services for our teachers and our students so that way they can recover from everything that's been going on over the last few years. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Youngblood. Uh, so the top three challenges I would say would be the politics that's in our schools, uh, good governance, and then transparency and responsiveness to parents. With regards to politics, I think if you want to ruin public education in the country and in this community, you're going to have politics come into it. And for me, when I look at the school lockdowns as a physician and how long they went on and the mask mandates and how, when they, how, how long they went on, those all had a lot of politics in them. Here locally, the tortilla gate, there was a lot of politics in that as well. And unfortunately for all three of those things, our kids suffered. So we as adults need to keep politics out of schools, keep it in the board as much as possible and let the kids focus on academics. With regards to uh, good governance, there was the four by four, you can argue about the educational uh, part of that. And then the process is uh, of how it was adopted, you know, completely passed in the middle of the pandemic and uh, overwhelming opposition from the teachers and a majority of opposition from the parents and they still pass it anyway. Uh, that's not how you run a, a, a school district. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Megliola. Um, what I see challenging is the loss of academics, especially during the school closures, implement uh, and get more tutors and implement uh, special programs for the mathematics and everything that the, our children are, are falling behind. Uh, their parents' concerns ha have not been heard throughout the, throughout the past years. Uh, so my main priority would be refocusing on academics and regain local control, keeping politics out of classrooms. All right, thank you. All right, for the next question, we're gonna give each candidate two minutes because we're, believe it or not, running slightly ahead of schedule. Uh, and we're gonna go back the other way now from my right to my left. So Ms. Uh, Meglioli, the first, uh, will answer this question first. 
if elected, what would you hope would be key accomplishments of the board during your years of service? Yes, um, most impo importantly is to work together as a board to look for what is best for our children, including transparency, knowing what is being spent exactly for the academics, the programs, the students' needs. Uh, if we need more teachers, more tutoring for class, uh, I would suggest also uh, the security of the campus. But most of all is working together as a school board unanimously to provide and come up with solutions for what's best in academics and for the overall well-being of the students. Okay, Mr. Youngblood. Uh, so in terms of accomplishments, uh, those would be addressing the challenges we just discussed to include keeping politics out. Uh, I also think that kind of uh, empowering and reestablishing that, uh, that bond or uh, uh, dialogue with parents is very important. I see parents as the number one stakeholder in their uh, children's education. And I think that that has been a problem over the last few years uh, because of opposition you know, to the four by four and other things like that, that it didn't seem like it was well communicated. Uh, so that needs to be addressed. And when you look at the school district, it's about 3000 students. And one of the problems is, is that during the pandemic, about 400 students were pulled out by their parents because they were dissatisfied with what was going on. So we need to reestablish that trust uh, with parents uh, because they're the ones who are going to uh, bring their kids back. And if you have a happy, happy parents, you're going to have a healthy school district. And I really believe that. I also think that you need to have good governance, be very transparent. So I think the various syllabi or syllabus for each course, for each grade needs to be published. Uh, and so everybody can kind of understand what their kids are being taught uh, in school. Uh, budgeting issues, I, I would certainly hope that we can address uh, the, uh, the air conditioning issue and the security issue and the facility upgrades. So those would be some things I would try to accomplish. Thank you. Right, Ms. Palacios Peters. Key accomplishments uh, during uh, the next school board session should be one, recovering from the learning loss. We know that students uh, did not perform as well over COVID and over Zoom. And so that is something that the district is already looking and moving in a positive direction with all the students back in school, but we're not there yet. There is a lot that needs to happen. And so that is something that needs to be a focus over the next few years. Secondly, infrastructure. We uh, have too many classrooms Class sizes are too big in our schools. At the elementary school, they've moved the kindergarten over, they've moved TK in, and they're gonna continue expanding TK. We're running out of space. Students are taking their speech therapy classes in hallways right now. We also know that the classrooms are hot. That happens a few times a year. We're fortunate in that, in that way, but we need to start figuring out how to move towards updating our buildings from the elementary schools all the way up through the high schools and making sure that our teachers and our students have a, the best learning environment possible to facilitate the recovering that learning loss. Thank you. Ms. Kavanaugh. As a school board member, our job is to set policy and provide oversight. So providing oversight of the budget, uh, making sure that we have uh, fiscally sound decisions, um, addressing learning issues, making sure that we have early screening for students so that any learning issues can be identified and proactive steps can be taken um, to prevent um, further being being up behind us um, later on in the school. I think that we need to make sure as a school board that we are ensuring that all students are welcome, all families are welcome on campus, and everyone feels included and part of our school community. Um, transparency and communication seem to be coming up a lot. I think it's important, and I know at a school board meeting, you have an opportunity to speak, but you don't have an opportunity to engage in dialogue. And I think a standing subcommittee, um, separate from the regular school board meeting where conversations can happen and information can be gathered, would go a long way into. Um, making sure that when we do have board meetings, we're taking care of the business that needs to happen at the board meeting and conversations and input can be taken at another time where it can be um, 
more easily um, incorporated into our, our programs. Ms. Anderson, first. School board members are elected individually, but the key to a functioning school board is that people get along. And that requires the ability to listen and to share divergent, <clears throat> diverse um, opinions without being angry or placing someone in the position of being uh, an opponent. Lively discussions are healthy. We need different opinions. I script everything that parents say uh, when they have public comments, and then I go back up over it after the meeting so I can see if there's something I can do to move that forward. I meet with parents who want to uh, share a concern. I spent three hours the other day with one of my favorite people. Uh, we agreed to disagree on a couple of things, but otherwise we discovered we have a lot more in common than we are different. We all want what's best for our children. We want them to be high achieving, healthy, uh, in a, an environment where they have access to the core curriculum in a safe and secure environment. And I applaud all that, but you may have heard we've, you know, we've had some interesting school board meetings. And if you watch the school board meeting, I'm the one who's measured, calm, and professional. I, I, I don't traffic in rudeness. I don't have vitriol. That's not my MO. I like divergent opinions. I like differences. I want to hear what you have to say, because if you don't tell us, we don't know. And that's a, that's a key role of a trustee. My constituents are children. I know that y'all vote, but the ones I care about are the students in school. We always talk about high school, but as a reading specialist, I would tell you, if a student um, isn't up to grade level by third grade, he's gonna have trouble for the rest of his academic career. So talking about it, being angry about it doesn't help, but it helps his intervention and a focus on children. And as a grandmother, mother, friend, and neighbor, I thank you. Yeah. All right, Ms. Mansion. Okay, like I said before, I told you the scores um, from 2021. I think um, we need to utilize master teachers on campus to try to um, change this situation. We need to do it dramatically. Um, and the best way we can do that is by focusing uh, the on-task instruction in the classroom. Uh, teachers should not be distracted by a lot of other political things going on or demands for um, all kinds of ideologies are coming down from Sacramento. And I think teachers need to be able to focus on the core subjects so that we can improve those test scores. All of these things that I'm suggesting will uh, improve the trust that the community will will have. Um, the other thing is I'm hearing from parents and grandparents that they don't feel heard by the district, the district or the school board. I think what we need to do is open up two-way conversations, um, not just a one-way at the school board, because uh, you can't, you can't, you don't feel heard. So I would suggest town hall meetings where you focus on whatever the current issues are that are of interest and get the community feedback and then implement because no one knows the kids like the parents. So I want you to know it's really important to me. Parents matter. We know our kids and we need to be heard. And then thirdly, uh, accountability systems need to be implemented so that we make sure that teachers are staying on that task, that they're not veering off into their opinions or um, other matters. Uh, we have many good school teachers. My kids have had good ones, but I'm afraid that that's a problem. And so I think uh, the administrators need to be held accountable to do that and make sure it's happening in the classroom. Thank you. Sandy. So I'd like to see us uh, create a functional and cooperative governing board where uh, police are no longer required to attend armed and in uniform. I, uh, I'd like to stop any lawsuits and fights with the state. Uh, I'd like to ensure that we understand how local control works. The schools have laws and mandates that they must follow. And then the state in 1972, a change to the constitution allowed the school districts as opposed to like the DMV. DMV has rules that they must follow. That's it. They can't color outside the lines. 
schools can. Schools can color outside the lines as long as it's, it's helping students in education. So they have to follow the laws and the mandates, but then they can color outside the lines with those, with those other areas. So we need, to, we need to follow that closely. In 2026, we're gonna to go to basic aid where we think we're gonna get a, a funding windfall. So it, it's gonna be great for our schools. Uh, so we need to plan for that. So the judicious use of that money, well, there's a meeting this afternoon at 1530 at the schools. I think most of us will probably be there to discuss that. Uh, we also have to have a plan in case that money doesn't come through, what are we gonna do? Ms. Anderson. So I think the number one thing that our school board needs to do is restore trust in the community. I think we've lost the trust of the students, the teachers, the staff, the community in general. And some of that is due to misperception and not information. For example, syllabi for every single class at any of our schools is online in the teacher portal. The curriculum, the curriculum is available. Your teachers are always available to talk, but if the community doesn't understand that, they might think that things are being taught in secret, which just simply is not the truth. I also think we need to address the pandemic learning loss. We have many groups. We have 41% military, 23% Hispanic, and 14% mixed race children. We need to make sure it's every child, every day, whatever they need. We also need to address the mental health of it's been a hard three years for everyone, the community, the students, the teachers, those of us that watched our kids do school on pandemic, the parents got a little bit of need, a little mental health help too. And we need to work on that. And of course, as I said before, securing our schools, keeping them safe for our children, which includes the air conditioning and of course, basic aid. We do, it's gonna be amazing. Starting in 2026, theoretically, we are gonna get 25% more money. Right now, our budget is 45 million a year. We're gonna get 25% more. That is an amazing opportunity. It's so exciting what we can do, but also we need to make sure it, it's used judiciously, that it's planned long range and short term goals. All of these things need to be taken care of. Thank you. And Mr. Iverson. Thank you. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll break it down into, into three categories for me. The first one is um, fiscal responsibility. Um, or, uh, or oversight, right? So um, we have to get some real decisions and make sure we know you know, our customer everybody talks about this transition to basic aid, which is terrific. Um, but I think that the district and the board in particular has already taken steps to spend some of that money that we don't even have yet. So somebody brought up earlier that the early childhood folks have now moved over to the school where they did that because they had to lease out the early childhood some of the movies so they can afford to pay the payments of the $12 million loan they took out in advance of once again, not even happening yet. So I've been in the business world for 25 years, and the only thing that I miss is that the future is uncertain. So I think having fiscal responsibility and making smart choices is really critical for us as a board. Uh, number two um, is communication, uh, communication, communication. I think a lot of the things that are brought up uh, could be avoided if there was a better path of communication. I think most of us have already said that there's a, a real desire, I think, amongst all of us to create more openness. So I, for one, plan to have, should I be elected, to have office hours where people can come and talk to me uh, at any time so that we can represent their opinions on the board, right? It's not my opinions that counts. I'm your custodian. I'm there to hopefully um, be a mirror of what you want. And the, the last thing for me is um, accountability. Okay, so I think over the last couple of years, which is really what motivated me to get into this race and why, has been just a lack of accountability. And I'm on this tour to give us an example. Several of the people on the administrative side that were in charge at that time were not only not like they were giving you know, jobs inside the district, continuing to make the same amount of money they made before. That's not accountability for me. It doesn't work that way. We've been for 25 years. If you make a mistake, I don't get to stick out and make the same amount of money. It's not how the red works. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, so good news. We've been moving along well. We have time for a fourth question. And each candidate's going to get two minutes to answer this question. And we're going to go back uh, left to right again. And the question is as follows What differentiates you from the other candidates? And Mr. Iverson, you're up. That's, that's a very good start. What differentiates me from the other candidates? Well, 
Um, it's, it's my background, okay? Um, I think I have a different lens um, uh, for education, given how I grew up, having gone to school all over the world and uh, fluent in two languages, I speak four. Um, my kids actually go to school, I have a to school in, in Europe right now. So I just think I have a different perspective than people that, that grew up here their entire lives and this is what they know. That's uh, uh, something I don't bring to the picture, but what I think you know, differentiates me uh, is my background and my international experience. Ms. Anderson. So I think something unique about me is that I have a historical perspective on Coronado and Coronado schools. As I said, I'm third generation. My son Clark just graduated as fourth generation Coronado. My second thing that I feel like is very important because of historical perspective is some of our school board candidates have kids in schools in school right now. They're right in sixth grade or they're so concerned about fourth grade. I have the advantage, the larger view of having seen three of my children go all the way from K through 12, graduate and launch successfully. It's, hot, it's better to be able to know if you're ex something's happening in sixth grade, I know, then comes seventh grade and eighth grade and ninth grade, and it just keeps going and it all works out. And every grade is important, but there's also a larger picture to the whole thing. I'm a business owner in Coronado and a homeowner in Coronado. I'm all in for Coronado. This is what I care about. This has always been my home, will always be my home. I, as many of the other candidates have said, have not taken any money for from either political parties or the political party leadership, which is not true for some of the other candidates. So my own constituents are our students, our parents, and our community. Also, I have a long history of volunteering in our schools. I've put in many hours, sometimes feels like a part-time job, working in our schools, knowing the teacher, the staff, the administration, and I look forward to working with them and um, doing good things for our school if I'm elected. All right, thank you. Sandy. What I think I, I bring to bear is I have a very strong financial background in program management. Uh, most recently for the Navy, I managed uh, three programs that by Navy standards are small, but they were $80 million uh, over the five-year program. So I, I know how to read budgets and understand them. I also have all the program management qualifications, both the civilian program management professional and the military, the highest level of military qualifications for that. So I understand money and program management. Uh, I have a child in the IEP program, individualized education program. So I, I know about special needs, familiar with that program and how Coronado handles those children. I, I have lived in many places so I can compare Coronado with other districts that we've experienced so we can see the what other districts did well and what we do well and how we can improve. Uh, I'm very positive about the Coronado schools. I'm the, I'm the biggest fan and I, I hope to see them uh, continue to incrementally improve and, and do great things. All right, thank you. Ms. Mason. Um, so what differentiates me? Uh, I'm a retired teacher, like I told you, both public and private experience. And um, I've been going to the school board meetings for the last year and a half out of concern for my children and what I've seen. So when I told you about my daughter's lesson, what I didn't tell you, I don't think, is, is the look in her eye when I had to explain to her what gender preference meant. She was 11 at the time, going through puberty, and this was a seed planted in her mind. For the first time, she had never considered that, wow, maybe I could have been, a, could be a boy. Uh, so I think what I'm worried about that's coming down from Sacramento is a lot of uh, politics that can affect the innocence of our children. And this is the way it's trending is it's going to be going down to kindergarten. And um, I just, I think parents have to stand up to this. I don't think it's appropriate to sexualize children at an early age. And so this is what I'm really concerned about and that does differentiate me. My, parent, my, my children, my own children experienced this. I have four grandchildren, two and under, and I don't want them to go through this in a public setting. And I think it's important as a community, and you guys are community leaders, for us to think about what 
do we want our kids to be learning? It is important. Um, the ramifications of going down this road is surgery that is radical, taking out healthy organs. I know this is hard to hear um, after having eaten lunch, but this is where the state is going and I'm really concerned. Thank you. Ms. Anderson Cruz. There's so many things. Uh, I've flunked retirement four times. Um, my my post-college career began at Juvenile Hall. I was not there. I worked there. Uh, one of my students told his parents, my teacher has been to jail, but they hired her anyway. So when I explained that to my students, what did you do before you were a teacher? I worked at Juvenile Hall, and they thought I said I lived at Juvenile Hall. Uh, so I have social worker experience. Uh, I taught K through 12. I have GATE certification. Um, I'm a fellow with the UCSD Writing Project, a fellow with the UCSD Reading Project. I have taught um, teachers in the teacher education program. I've placed student teachers in all of South County. I was a teacher. I am a teacher. Um, teaching, I left teaching, but teaching didn't leave me. I'm still a teacher. I. Um, at the end of my first retirement, I went to USC to get a doctorate, and then they hired me. So I, that made me happy. I got some money back from them. Uh, my mother got Alzheimer's, so I had to retire and take care of her. I didn't have to. I chose to take care of my mom. And then a couple of days after my mother went to heaven, the dean at San Diego State asked me to teach one class for one semester, and I was there for 10 years, and I retired from there. Um, and then... I worked on the CSF Board of Trustees until I was elected to the school board, and here I am. And, and I want to tell all of you, I am an Islander. I was born in Guam, and y'all are Navy people, so you know where that is. Uh, so you're pretend Islanders. I'm a, I'm a real Islander. I love kids. Kids are my life. I've spent 40 years uh, in education. I am the mother of a wonderful, gorgeous human being who's a first grade teacher and a granddaughter who's also perfect. All right, thank you. Ms. Kavanaugh. Perfect granddaughter, my goodness. Um, I think what differentiates me from um, Ms. Machen and uh, Ms. Butcher, who are, um, we we're in the same two year raised together, is that um, I'm the only one that's been a teacher here in our school district. Um, I know our students, um, I know our system, I know our process. Um, I have had firsthand experience working on school site committees where we set short and long-term goals. I've been involved in um, providing input into the local control accountability plan. Um, I have that experience ready to bring. Um, the other thing that differentiates me from um, the other candidates uh, in the two-year race is that I don't want to remove books from libraries as Ms. Nation said that she would do last night. Um, I think that if a, a parent objects to a book that their child is reading, I think that is a wonderful opportunity for a meaningful discussion about why that book may not mesh with your family values. But I don't want it removed from schools because other students may want to read it and other families may want their children to read that. Um, I think of a school board as kind of like a classroom that mirrors that in a way. As a teacher, I had some parents who were very, very, very vocal advocates for their students. And then I had other parents who were kind of um, quietly supportive in the background. And then I have some parents who were absent. But as a school board member, as a teacher, as a teacher, I advocated for everyone in my classroom, regardless of what the level of parental input was. At a school board, you need to do the same thing. You do want input. Strong parental input makes a great school and a great district, but decisions have to be made for what's best for the student. And that's what I will do. I think our students deserve an honest, accurate, and comprehensive education. All right, thank you. Ms. Blasio, Peter. Being a member of the school board means that you have to bifurcate yourself. 
you have to walk into that school boardroom and you have to leave your personal views and your political views at the door. When you sit on that dais, you are there as a representative for everyone in the community and you are there to protect the school district legally and comport yourself with the fiduciary responsibility of a school board member. And as an attorney, that's something that I've done for years. As an attorney, you have to walk in and argue your case, whether you believe your client, whether your client was right or wrong, you make the argument based on the law. You don't make that argument based on what you think about your client or whether you think that law is stupid, you have to work that case. And so that is what I bring as a candidate to this school board race is the ability to look beyond personal views and leave those outside and to serve as somebody who is looking at the facts that are in front of us. And do, in doing so, I'm here to represent every student in this district, the 41% of military families who are here and being able to understand that they may have parents who are deployed they may be doing a geo bachelor situation where one parent is serving somewhere else, but they live here. I'm here to represent the 20 plus percent of minority students that are here, the Hispanic students, English as a second language, and our LGBT students. We have LGBT students in our district. And whatever you think about people who have a different lifestyle, you have to leave that at the door because when state when laws come down from Sacramento, there's no arguing. If you have a problem with the law, go to Sacramento. That's not something that's here locally for the school board to determine. We're here to follow state laws, keep us from being sued and spending money on lawsuits because that money could be better utilized in our classrooms with our teachers and with our students. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Youngblood. So, so I guess the, uh, the first and most obvious thing is I'm a physician uh, in, certain, in terms of setting me apart. I've uh, you know, dedicated my entire career as a physician to practicing evidence-based medicine and empowering patients for informed consent and letting them decide for themselves and their families what, what uh, kind of medical care they, they should have. And I think over the last couple of years, it's actually been very tough for me to kind of see my profession become so highly politicized and kind of established understandings in epidemiology with lockdowns and masking for the population, all that to be kind of turned on its head because the politics changed, but the science didn't really. Um, I think also when we differentiate uh, uh, candidates here, and I think you can kind of see a pattern there are some, some candidates who are kind of agree with the status quo. Maybe they want to nibble at the edges a little bit, but, uh, and then there are change candidates and I'm certainly one of those. And I, I want to fight for our kids. Uh, I do not want to accept the status quo if it's not working for them. Uh, and I want to work within the rules to uh, really try to make their education better and make sure that every kid uh, who comes through Coronado Unified as the best educational opportunity possible. Thank you. All right, Ms. Megliola. What di differenti differentiates me is raising a big family. I have five children. I believe that is a, a strong formation in giving me skills necessary, ability to mediate, find a compromise, face challenges and obstacles, achieve the best possible outcome in situations, said that I as a parent know there is always a time and age for children to learn certain subjects. I'm a mom looking for the best for our children and our community. Us parents decide on our, on our children's education and on, on their health decisions. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, I'd like to thank all of our candidates for coming here and participating today. It's certainly been enlightening for all of us. Uh, I'm sure if you have questions of individual candidates, they'll be happy to stick around and talk to you all. Uh, our next meeting is October 5th at the Hotel Dell, where we will have a similar forum for city council candidates. Your moderator will be our own Jean Marie Bond, and I suggest she put the notes in a bigger font for herself than she did for me. So thank you all. We'll see you next week. <clears throat>
Okay, we're going to turn on. We're going to end the meeting right now.